next talk uh, is uh, Reid Reid. You won't have Reid's uh, uh, presentation in your, uh, in your reports, but if you're willing, uh, the, you've got the back page to make notes if you want about things in the uh, US. Uh, Reid joined us, as I mentioned earlier, from North Dakota. Uh, originally grew up in Texas and, uh, and did his undergrad at Texas A&M, uh, which is apparently some sort of university, uh, the big football one. Uh, I think I was figuring out yesterday, it's still a little bit, yeah. Johnny Football, that's right. Uh, but Reid's here today to, uh, yeah, so Reid's here today to basically give us an overview of uh, what, what they're doing with NSIP. Uh, for those that aren't aware, so NSIP is the, uh, is the land plant equivalent in the States, and since 2009, uh, Sheep Genetics have been providing the analysis service for uh, NSIP. So we look forward to a, uh, a good in, um, update of what is exactly going on over in the uh, in the state. So I'll give you a read, read. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's my pleasure to be here. Um, I, let's get straight to it. The main reason is, is when I got on the plane to leave Fargo, North Dakota, it was 30 degrees below zero. So <laughs> if I had to stand outside in my shirt very long, you know, we're going to be amputating fingers. So it's uh, quite nice to come and enjoy your weather uh, for a minute. i fortunate to be able to speak with you. Um, I'm going to try and share some random thoughts and hopefully stimulate some ideas and things. But the really reason I'm here is to learn from you. Um, to, we use your services to help uh, provide EBVs to our producers, um, and it, it burns me a little bit. I'm okay with it, but it burns me that someone else is so much further ahead than us. You know, in America, we're supposed to be leading things, and being from Texas, we're supposed to be the biggest stuff. You know, but we're way behind, um, and that's quite apparent. I, I would like to say that um, you should commend yourself for what you've accomplished as growers, providing the vision by getting the the funds and the things in place to be able to do these things. Um, you have, it, it's quite similar here as it is in the US. You have people that are speaking that are at the universities and everybody wears ties and stands in the back. You know, and I didn't wear a tie and I sat down, so I'm a part of you this time. If I was in the States, it's gonna be totally different. But I, I'd like to just say, just take a round of applause and applaud yourself for what you've done as an industry to get this far ahead. I mean, I, I'm just amazed. Where have you gone over the last few years? And it's, it's, it's great that you're on the gas pedal. You're pushing forward, you're asking all the right questions and going in the right direction, in my opinion, compared to what I'm looking at in our industry trying to provide leadership. And it's quite apparent that we're at least 20 years behind in using technology that's been right in front of us the entire time, but the industry hasn't made the commitment to do it. So um, I'd applaud yourself for that. I also came over to look for a speaker because we're trying to do a webinar series to get going, and I haven't asked him yet, but I might ask Tom because I'm gonna present it as Hugh Jackman talks about sheep genetics. And, <laughs> and we've got probably 40% or so, about 40% or so of our managers are women, so I think that would bring a really big draw. We've got more people at a sheep genetics thing than ever. So, um, you know, we good there? Or? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, again, um, applaud yourself for what you're doing. I think you're going in a great direction, and, and I'm here to learn as much as anything. Um, so, uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I speak around that the industry in, in the sheep industry in the U.S. is quite small. Um, I'm one of the few younger people that's going into it. The industry is getting older and even the educators are getting older. And I try to, to leave a little bit of mark because I, I have a passion for the sheep industry and I like to get around. And one of the ways that I do that is try and start off something with a little bit of a story instead of just getting straight to the facts because sometimes the facts get lost when you go to those meetings because so much of it is driven by facts. Okay, so it's a small world. I, I get on a plane, and I'm on a plane for 20 hours, and I get off, and I get off in Texas, <laughs> where I grew up, or it looks very much like Texas when I got out of the plane, um, because your area here in Waga is, is um, very similar to what I grew up in, and so I, I was kind of taken back a little bit. I was expecting a different scenery, but it's quite the same. 
Um, and it's also a small world because as I was flying in the seat back pocket for Qantas, I pick it up and it says, visit Marfa, Texas. So being a Texas kid, I have an advertisement in your thing to go visit Marfa. Um, Marfa is kind of way out in the western part of the state. It's one of the most arid, uh, desert-like areas. I haven't been to the outback, but I would assume that it's kind of similar to that. Um, it's very rural, about 100 kilometers. I'm working on my metric while I'm here, 100 kilometers from any other town, so pretty good drive. Um, way out in the middle of nowhere, which is very much a rural community, except in the last little time there's been a, a big influx of, we would call them um, hippies or, you know, uh, kind of yuppies or different people who moved into this and they've taken over this little town. Apparently Austin was too weird for them, so Austin is one of the weirdest places in Texas, so it's the only place that's democratic, but uh, you know, I got a huge red state one little blue spot right there. Um, but anyways, they've gone out there, but they didn't tell me about this. I was driving from where I live in the central part of the state to where I was doing my master's degree, and it's about a nine hours drive, and it was one in the morning, and I had a legitimate reason to be driving at that part of the night. We're not gonna go into it, we don't have time. But anyways, I'm driving down this road, 100 miles from anywhere, and I passed this thing, which was in your seat back pocket guide. Um, my phone didn't take a very good picture of it, but this is a Prada store. You wanna know what Prada is? Okay, very, very expensive shoes. And it's about five miles out of town, and I'm driving in the middle of the night. Has anyone seen the movie No Country for Old Men? That's where they shot this. Okay, so it's a crazy, scary place. And I'm driving at one in the morning, and I drove past that, and I go, that's a Prada store. Someone's trying to kill me. It scared the bejesus out of me. I don't think I've ever been that scared in my life. And then I get reminded of this on the plane here. So very small world. Um, if you learn nothing, you'll remember my Prada story, hopefully. So. You may have more sheep, but we have more weird people. Until you see a Prada store in the outback, I think, I think we've got it. We've got the candle. <laughs> All right, so a little bit about our industry. Um, last year, we produced about 3.5 million sheep, plus or minus two or three million. <laughs> <laughs> We don't really know how many lambs don't go through a federally inspected place. Um, it's a large portion, um, and I'll get into more of that in a bit. But um, there's, there's around 83,000 ranches or farms, however you'd like to determine that. Um, but of those, 50% of them have less than 25 sheep. <laughs> so as an educator, that's difficult. And most of them didn't grow up with them, and so they have a lot of questions, like, what's the difference between a sheep and a goat? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> man, <laughs> we got a long ways to go here. Um, about 800 operations run 1,000 or more sheep. So not big operations, but big for our standards. Um, but they produce 50% of the lambs. So very driven by a small subset. That's about 2%. I've got a figure that I'll show you here in a minute. Um, a map of the United States, this is where I grew up, is right at um, Utopia, Texas, actually, a little paradise place right about there. Um, Marfa, for your instance, is right out here, big counties, because there's not very many people. Um, and I was going to school at my master's out here, Texas A&M, Johnny Football, coming, coming from over there. And then I came up and did a PhD in Montana, and now I live in the coldest place in the world. So... Um, <laughs> Each of these blue dots represents a thousand sheep. So to kind of give you an idea of where most of our sheep are, um, a big pocket right here, this is good sheep and goat country. Then when you come up through here, there's a lot of grasslands and mountainous country where they run a lot of sheep. Uh, highest concentration of our lamb feeders in the northern part of Colorado. And then in the Midwest here, there's some, there's some sheep production, but it's mostly a byproduct of agronomy. So using grains, feeds, byproducts, etc. All right. Um, we've never been up to the 150 million mark, but we did have a viable industry at one point in time um, at 55 million sheep in the U.S. So this graph shows from 1940 to 2000, and I'm going to tell you right now that we blame you on this. <laughs> um, there is a, a, a big sentiment that whenever people came back from World War II, they, in America we don't eat mutton. 
And when they came over to fight in the wars over here, they had a lot of canned mutton. And a lot of people went back to the farm and just quit sheep altogether because they didn't know the difference between mutton and lamb. And, and really, uh, I don't hold it against you. I'm just providing facts. Um, but, you know, from that to the 1950s, after that, that's all on us. Okay, so um, we dropped off producers. And most of it's just on the farms. It's... It wasn't really profit-driven. There was just so much other money to be made in other places. And so uh, they drifted away from sheep because it wasn't high priority for them. Uh, again, let's look at lamb consumption from that same time period. Uh, prior to World War II, we were at 4.8 pounds per American, and that dropped off considerably. Uh, maybe that initial drop-off, again, was the negative attitude towards mutton. Uh, but most of it after that has been it's not there, um, and it's not being promoted. So it's not really that the consumption is going down, which led to a reduction in production. It's the other way around. Um, but the, the lamb, just the lambs weren't there. Uh, so this graph here uh, shows lamb consumption since 1980. So the green line across the top is American consumption of lamb. Uh, the blue line is American production of lamb. And the red line is imported lamb. So you can see that starting in the late 90s where imports really started to make up the difference because we weren't producing for our demands. And that's benefited you quite well, I believe. Um, but lamb and or mutton in general is fairly small in the US. We can see beef, or, uh, beef consumption per person um, at that 100 pound mark, divided by 2.2, sorry. Um, chicken has gone up, pork's remained fairly stable, but this has always been quite low. It's a, it's a niche meat, really. Um, but we do have an opportunity because the price of lamb, uh, this was in 2010, and it's been this way for quite some time. Lamb has been a premium meat in the U.S., uh, and it has you know, 40% uh, over our beef prices. And so our consumers are willing to pay more for lamb as long as they're provided a quality product. So uh, I, the longer that I'm in this and I get more background from our leaders, the more I get discouraged about the American future. There's a lot of hope there, but we've done a lot of poor things as an industry um, that's been our own enemy. And, and I say that um, just a number of different things where we could have gone down a different path. Technology for genetic improvement is one of the, one of the big things. Um, but we have a very strong demand, and it could be even larger had we capitalized on it. Uh, but our supply, our domestic supply, is fairly weak. Um, it's instable and inconsistent, and that's why a lot of our consumers have gone to an Australian product or something that's a little more consistent, or they've just gone to a different protein altogether. Um, our market inefficiencies has been a, a big issue. The profitability on the farm, you tend to make more money in the sheep industry than you do the beef industry but people don't like losing money. So it's that every five years where you're in the red that's a real problem. I've been involved in the industry quite closely since about 2000, and in that time we've had five boom and busts. And every time you have a bust, um, you lose a lot of producers. And so uh, a lot of the market inconsistencies and the unstable land prices are what's, what hurts us. Um, again, the industry took a long time to really start promoting our own product. Uh, our, our promotion is a checkoff, which started in 2002, um, but if you remember the charts, we were a really low sheep population at that time, so we've always had a fairly small budget um, to promote lamb, and that's why it leads me to believe that they're very effective, but if that was tripled or quadrupled, we really have a lot of options to, to get more lamb consumption in the U.S. It takes time, but there's a lot of uh, market there, in my opinion. I'm not an economist, so a little bit of my opinion, and I'm a half glass full person because I like the sheep industry. Um, our traditional consumers are typically white tablecloth, so high-end restaurants um, and premium retail stores. Most of the mid-range you won't find. Where you'll find lamb is in our big wholesales, uh, Walmart, Costco, I don't know if you're aware of those, but those are really large chains, and it's typically imported lamb. All right? The best thing that you guys could do for us is be less efficient. <laughs> you produce a cheaper product than we can. Right? And, and so that, that pushes a lot of your product, and I say that tongue-in-cheek, I'm not um, saying that uh, with any type of sincerity. 
so that's our traditional consumers is premium retail stores. Um, we have real no mutton market, but real mutton market. A lot of times it goes to Mexico, but that border opens and closes all the time, and it drives down our coal U prices, um, which is one of our biggest detractors from the beef industry because they get we eat a lot of hamburger. I'm sure you all know that, <laughs> and and that drives up our our beef prices for call animals. They can get quite a good value for their uh, spent animals. Um, so there's not much of a mutton market, and the people that consume it are typically high in income uh, demography, so large affluent populations. Non-traditional, this is the biggest thing in up and coming in the U.S. We have a very growing group of uh, ethnic populations that have a demand for lamb, uh, that we have a difficult time getting to them. Unfortunately for you, a lot of them want it domestically produced. Um, so I think that's where there's a lot of a partnership where America and Australia can function together as you're providing a product that we can't produce, but we've got a large growing population of ethnic producers uh, that we're trying to reach out to. Uh, we do have some more local stuff. The big trend in, in America right now is local, know your farmer. Um, so local restaurants, local retail stores. Um, and they want a different product, and lamb kind of serves some of that role. So a lot of hope there. That's one of our biggest opportunities. Um, mutton sales have been better because direct off the farm sales. There's a lot of, of uh, ethnic consumers that are picking those up. Um, and, but that's only going to work in smaller operations. There's not enough of them to, to consume, you know, four or five hundred ewes that you're getting rid of. So uh, pretty small. But ethnic groups and local foodies are probably the biggest trend in the U.S. right now. So I mentioned that with sheep produced and the number of farmers, I did a little graph here. Here's less than 25 sheep or 1,000 sheep uh, or more, and you can see the red blocks, the red box, red bars is the percentage of sheep that are produced, whereas the blue is the number of farms. So it's just completely opposite, um, and this causes a lot of concern because there's so many people producing it that have opinions and ideas, and lots of times they don't fit with how the industry really should be going. So it, it, it's a challenge. Um, we're, we're trying to work together. So for our traditional industry, uh, especially out west where you see a lot of the bigger operations, the biggest operations are typically herded operations. Are you all familiar with that? Have you kind of know much about our herded operations? But out west, it's all public lands. Um, a lot of it is owned by a national forest or government or state and they have wheat grazing contracts. So operators will have somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 sheep, and for each six or 800 ewes, they have one herder. We bring those in from different countries, typically, uh, because they live with the sheep 24-7, um, all year long. So they go out, and you see this picture of sagebrush flats um, down in the, in the desert. They'll, they'll winter there, and then they'll go up into the mountains, into the high country during the summer. It's a very efficient way to grow out sheep, but Again, it's not something that our general public really likes to see. They would rather be the wild animals frolicking out there than sheep creating a product for them to eat or wear, but they don't really realize that. So, um, so that's in our mountain country where I grew up. Most of it's range type of, or range fenced in operations would be very similar to Australia, I believe. Um, Again, these are both fine wool, heavily fine wool areas where they would be fenced in. We have a lot of predation issues, so a lot of guard dogs are fencing to keep coyotes out. Uh, predation is probably the number one reason uh, that people struggle. It's probably also the number one excuse for people to get out. But, um, whereas beef cattle don't have those. When you get into more of the Midwest, this is a picture of our barn at NBSU. Uh, we have quite large facilities because, again, when it's 30 below zero, and sheep aren't going to do all that well unless you provide some protection for them. So they stay in the barns throughout the winter. In the summer, they may get out on grass. People are going more and more into just dry lot operations because they can remove predators, parasites, all kinds of things of that nature. Um, high input operations. And then we have feedlots. I, on the graph, I showed you in Colorado where most of the feedlots are. Uh, when you get into the west where it doesn't rain much, they'll have outdoor feeding facilities. Most lambs come in at uh, I would say 40 kilograms, and then are fed up to 80 kilograms, so um, they get to quite big lambs. And they, that, you'd laugh at 80, but some of them were 100. <laughs> so um, pretty large lambs. 
Uh, when you get into the Midwest, they put them in more uh, feeding facilities, hoop type structures with self feeders. So it's quite a different, kind of different operating system across the U.S. And they're they're quite variant. Our sheep, the Rambouillet, is dominated in the West. Um, again, it's a fine wool fine wool sheep that's anywhere from 18 to 25 microns. Most of the commercial operators are somewhere from 18 to 22. A lot of our purebred show operations get really high and they don't test at all, but if you do test them, they're quite, quite coarse. Uh, the Targi is a, is a cross. It's a th three quarters Rambouillet and a quarter strong wool. Pretty dominant in some of our commercial operations. Not super fine, but again, you all produce a, a very fine wool product, and so we kind of hit some of the medium wool, so it's a 22, 23, and uh, raised twins quite consistently in harsh country. The Columbia was a nice sheep until it really was bred into extinction because they got them just so big that they were unproductive. Um, again, this is a Rambouillet over here. That's a six foot panel. So it was like four foot at the litter. So um, it takes a lot of grain to get that animal that big. <laughs> sure. And that's not commonplace, but there are some of those exceptions out there. Uh, throughout the Midwest, we would call these the maternal wolves. Uh, the polypay is a four-way composite breed, um, really high litter, high litters. They raise a lot of lambs, pretty high input systems, but they're also very high output sheep. Um, the dorset, although you use the dorset as a terminal, we use the dorset more as a maternal line uh, because it's out of season breeding, it's prolificacy. Uh, most of our terminals are, are larger black-faced animals because we're hitting a larger uh, larger size where the, these terminals don't get as quite as large, although in MSIP they do run as terminals. Um, the fin sheep is not a commercial, but it is a part of the composites. And then the Romanoff sheep, which is black, which would be sacrilege for most, uh, most operations around here, but very high, high number of lambs born and, and they have a higher survival rate than fin sheep, so they're being used in different, in different uh, breeding strategies. Our terminal sires would be Suffolk and Hampshire's are probably the dominant terminal sires. Uh, quite large, very growthy animals. There, are, there is a growing, growing trend for smaller framed, uh, earlier maturing, faster growing type sheep. So our Texels, uh, Sire Max is another composite. I'm just kind of throwing some of these out there. I don't have enough numbers to give you the balance of where they're at, but maybe stimulate some ideas and questions. Um, our hair sheep are what you would call shedders. Uh, the the Dorper is fairly popular, especially in Texas where I grew up. It used to be probably 90% Rambouillet sheep, and I bet it's 50% or more Dorpers now. So they really uh, transitioned over because they're easier care sheep. Um, they say there's not shearers around, but they're just not willing to pay shearers or treat them very well, so that's the reason that they're not around. Uh, the Katahdin is a very popular throughout the Midwest and all over. It's, a, again, a composite, a higher number of lambs born, fairly good maternal maternal ewe. Um, where I grew up, there's a barbado black belly that'll eat rocks and trees to live on, so pretty easy, easy keeping animal, not a very good carcass, but uh, there, there's a lot of differences and things out there. I would say as a, as a whole, our genetic improvement has either gone backwards or nowhere at all in the last 20 years. They really, they've gotten them not bigger, but maybe bigger, but taller, definitely taller. Um, but you don't eat the air underneath them. Um, it's been quite frustrating. Uh, for me, uh, our youth development, am I running out of time here? No. Okay. Um, our youth development, one of the tough things I was talking with Darren earlier, uh, yesterday, that as our youth are coming through high school, they get them into 4-H, they get a lamb project, they feed, they buy a lamb at an overpriced and feed it expensive feed and then take it to a show and get paid too much for it. And then once they get out of that, they go to college and may get some more of that and by the time they come out to the industry and talk to me I have to retrain everything so it's not training <laughs> it's retrain and so not saying that you can't show but it's very difficult to get those production practices in place once you've set in a paradigm of what is an ideal animal um, and, and to the same degree of breeding animals again you can see that's that guy's six foot something so quite a large sheep um, and, and most of the commercial industry has divorced the, the show side, so they're kind of coming back. Um, our industry is so small, I'm trying to get the, the purebred lines to get in this to kind of bring them back in, because 
we need more people. We really can't diverge our industry much at all. So um, very reliant on the show ring, and, and it's difficult. Again, our breed associations, for the most part, are run by hobbyists that really have no commercial implications. So it's difficult. Maybe I'm giving, maybe it sounds really bad. <laughs> there is some highlights out there, but I'm giving you the average. Um, this is the reason I'm here, as, as they've recruited me to kind of take over the leadership of the National Sheep Improvement Program. Um, we have four really good, what I would call, success stories that have used the, used the program quite effectively. Where, you know, at least they're not 20 years behind you, just 10. <laughs> um, and so the Suffolk breed, the Targhees, uh, the Polypays, and the Katahdins, these four breed groups have put together not as organized as your groups, but they have shared genetics to a degree that they're making pretty good genetic progress. Um, and so we're trying to build on that and, and grow it. It's a fairly limited number of producers and the commercial base doesn't really understand it yet because we haven't had the industry-wide education that we need. Uh, the USDA did a survey and they asked producers um, what they ranked when they make all kinds of different flock management decisions and one of them was breeding and they asked were they, what things were most important in an animal and phenotype was at 80%, EBVs, 2% of people ranked that as a top priority when they selected for genetics. That's very discouraging um, and, and that's what we're trying to work to improve. Uh, in the U.S., we do have fairly reliable resources. They're quite expensive, but throughout the Midwest, uh, we, you know, we store a lot of water and snow throughout the winter, so it's reliable when it's there, so we, we can do a good job of raising lambs. So in this graph here, this is, this is lamb crop, so as a percentage of breeding use. Um, in this area where they've incorporated a lot of fin genetics, uh, they're at, as a, that entire state had 163% weaning rate or, or marking rate. So quite, quite productive in this area because they've used composites, um, but my great state of Texas is at 0.73, so um, they were in a drought, but the year before they were at 0.69, it rained, they went up to 0.73. So, you know, they're showing some improvement, but uh, not really gonna meet the demands. So throughout, throughout the country, there's, there could be a lot of improvement. When we get into the, into the West, they have guaranteed grass and lots of it. So why aren't we producing more lambs? And, and as an industry, we have to. We're not going to grow the number of breeding ewes a bunch, but we can produce more lambs. And I think you've seen that. You're producing more pounds of lamb to the consumer with the same or less ewes. And that's the approach that we have to take. Um, the, the crop has always been about 110%. Some states will move around, but we're not making that genetic progress. And reproduction is probably our strongest suit. So um, I've run out of time. I was going to do a little bit of this swat, but we'll skip past that. Um, the one hope that I have right now, and, and again, I'm an optimist and I've been a part of this, and so I hope this actually allows our industry to grow and, and be better, and, and it actually probably affects you as well, because the more that we're promoting lamb, the more lamb they're gonna eat, and I don't know that it's just gonna be domestic. Uh, so, so our industry, our meat packers, our lamb board, our national associations, and all that have kind of come together and said, it's going down the wrong path, how do we change it? And so they've put out what we call the, the American Lamb Industry Roadmap. And it's kind of a roadmap to do the things that you're doing for a large, to a large degree. Um, and they hired an outside company to look at this product characteristics by producing a more consistent product. Um, they, they put together teams of people to really, you know, that has everybody in that's got stake in the game to get a part of it. And so hopefully this, this relates to something that puts us on a better track with our demand and our demand for lamb. I think there's opportunity. Uh, so product characteristics, uh, creating some new products. America, we always want something new, something different. And so doing different things with lamb is a high priority. So if we could do that, I think we can capitalize on a lot of market share. Productivity improvement starts with National Sheep Improvement Program using this technology. So our entire industry, which they haven't done before, is saying use this or we're going down the wrong path. And so we'll see if they actually listen, if we actually get our industry to take hold of technology. So 
hopefully that the industry will kind of all collaborate together and, and, and move us in the right direction so we can create more demand and more product and have a cooperative relationship with others that are bringing where I'm in. So with that, I would uh, be glad to entertain any questions. Anybody shoveled sheep out of snow before? <laughs> Thanks, Harry. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Do we have time for a question? We always have time for a question or two. Um, I'll start. Do you have a, a shortage of horses in the uh, States? Is that why you grow sort of the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's probably a good market to make saddles for sheep. <laughs> Yeah, we don't have a shortage for horses. <laughs> <laughs> right, guys, any, uh, any questions? Um, I guess obviously uh, one of the graphs that really uh, uh, stuck out with me in your presentation was that uh, you know, percentage of land being produced and the uh, you know, broken up by the size of the uh, operation. From an extension point of view, sort of, uh, you know, how do you really engage with, you know, do you have different strategies basically to engage along that uh, different percentages or is it sort of a blanket promotion or extension message that you put to the living insurers as a Is that regarding genetic improvement? Well, yeah, genetic, or even if it's just generic sheep, uh, extension in general. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of what we do is, is developing youth and so we start from the very basic level. And, and a lot of those youth aren't always youth, they're young adults that are interested in this, and so you start at the base level and start working um, from just the basics that, you know, nutrition, genetics, um, all of those things, and so try and work up. They have passion for the industry, so keeping that passion um, directed in the right direction to, to get to a point where they're productive members of the industry is kind of our goal. Steve Fonz from Denolgan. I'm not sure if I have my facts right here, but the American government insure corn crops and agricultural crops for the grow, but I guess they don't for sheep. So that would be one one reason to buy a tractor instead of a sheep, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. And do, do you have uh, agricultural subsidies at all for sheep production over there? We do have a, a little bit. Uh, our national organization kind of gets a bit of, of funding. Um, there's funding that goes into the educational, the land grant universities and such. Uh, we do have a, recently had an insurance program that was supposed to predict land prices into the future and so you could buy essentially a contract on what the market would be. You couldn't get insurance on your own lambs. Um, but our our sheep industry is so fickle that most of the people that raise sheep knew more about what the sheep industry prices were going to do than the economists. And so our sheep producers were breaking <laughs> the program um, because they could predict what prices were going to do better. And so the insurance company stopped offering it because they were losing so much money. So we tried to do something to put price stability and it caused more stability. So hopefully they get that fixed, but you're right. Uh, a lot of producers, if you could guarantee them a price and they knew how to produce a product and make a living at it, they would do it. And, and that's why they tend to drift to other things that have something more secure. Protection. So, price protection, absolutely. Uh, who's got Andrew? The last one. Breed in the, uh, in the Angus breed, um, on the cattlemen, I'm sure there's cattlemen in the room, but in the Angus breed in the 80s and 90s particularly, we uh, sourced the eggs from the States at a much uh, bigger gene pool that you you know, Fast superior genetics, especially in the carcass and other traits. And we simply went and shopped in the States for genetics, brought them back in. We had uh, very steep genetic gains. I wonder if you guys, from what you've told me today, are shopping for genetics actively in Australia to get very quick genetic gains. Um, is that happening now? Is it going to happen? It's a great idea. Um, I think there will be a, a bit of a resistance because they're going to have to decrease in size and some people may be a little bit adverse to that. Um, there are some people that are bringing in genetics that are AIing. Uh, one of the tough things though is we don't have a lot of AI technicians. Um, even pregnancy scanning, because there's so few around, there's not the trained technicians out there. So um, there is a demand for genetics um, and there is some limited availability out there. If we could get 
I was I was hoping to actually meet up with some some technician or, or AI consulting groups to see if we couldn't do some work to maybe get a division going to where that service was was more available so that we could do that. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've made such genetic progress. Why would we recreate the wheel instead of just jump in and buy some of it? So, great. Thanks. Hey, guys. Uh, right. Just on behalf of everyone here, uh, thanks for what was a very entertaining and, uh, and great talk on uh, everything, including the Aussie Q, uh, the Sheep Genetics Hugh Jackman. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've just got a Sheep Genetics hat that you can uh, take with you back to the States. Um, they're all a fad. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is it flat drill? It's not flat drill. But we can't not uh, mine it if you want. All right, all right. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you.